Hey everybody, welcome back to the 2024 edition of my Picks and Sight for Dummies Like Me course. Today we're going to do our first full workflow with the color camera. I'm assuming that you've got everything installed and you've stacked your images together and you're ready to keep things nice and simple with our first workflow. We'll start off by going to File, Open. And because this is our very first workflow, I want to keep this pretty straightforward. So I think we'll go with the Orion Nebula. This will give me a good chance to explain some of the valuable tools here in PixInsight. When your photo loads in, you're actually going to have two different images. The first is just a mask of your auto crop, and this is not necessary, so you can close this one out, and we can now focus on our real photo. The image that we're working with today was captured with the Optolong L Quad Enhanced Filter from a fairly light polluted area, I would say Bortle 5 roughly. This was taken with the SpaceCAD telescope, and I had anywhere from one to three hours of data. I really don't remember, it's not that important. As part of our workflow today, I wanna to give you guys very specific steps that you can follow on your own. This is something I expand upon in my 2024 edition of the Deep Space course. So if you like this kind of instruction, you might wanna check that out. Step number one is always to rename our photos, because the original file names here are just really convoluted and of no use to us. For this reason, we'll double click on the file name, and you're free to call this whatever you want to. I'm gonna go with Orion for today. And I always get in the habit of hitting Control or Command A immediately, which auto stretches the image. So you might wanna do the same thing. Again, that's Control or Command A. This is very powerful because it quickly allows us to see not only the data, but all the problems with the data. So if step number one is to rename our photo, step number two would be, I guess, hit Control or Command A to see your image. Step number three is actually to fix any star distortion in the photo, because what you might find is that your stars are not exactly sharp. Mine are pretty good, but even in the corners here, you can see they're not quite spherical. For this reason, as part of step number three, we're gonna run Blur Exterminator. If this is not listed anywhere here, just type in Blur up top, and provided you followed along in the installation video, you should have Blur Exterminator. Next, I want you to turn on Correct Only. We only want to correct for the star distortion, nothing else right now. With correct only turned on, we'll drag and drop the triangle onto the photo. This will now run Blur Exterminator on our image as part of step number three. And this is one of the most magical parts of the workflow, especially if your stars were not exactly sharp or spherical. So check this out. If we maximize our preview here, and do a before and after, you can see that originally the stars were quite deformed, now they're much sharper. That's a power blur exterminator, correct only. Step number four is to fix the color cast with spectrophotometric color calibration. Believe me, I know that's a weird one, but it's SPCC is the abbreviation that we use. You'll also find this under your process explorer. I've got it here, but if you don't have it, just type it up top, spectro, and there it is, spectrophotometric color calibration. With SPCC, or Spectrophotometric Color Calibration, you've got quite a few different options here. Maybe you're using the Optolong L Ultimate or the L Extreme, who knows? Well, whatever you have, you need to make sure you select it for red, green, and blue. Right now, it's defaulting to a Sony color sensor, which would be like your ZWO camera, with a UVR cut filter. But in my case, if I use the Optolong L Enhance, for example, I would choose that for red, green, and blue. This helps to confirm that the colors match appropriately. Again, maybe using the L Ultimate or the L Extreme, make sure you choose that for red, green, and blue. Because these are narrowband filters, you'd also wanna change the white reference from average spiral galaxy, which is the default, to photon flux here at the very bottom. Anytime you're doing narrowband, you have to do photon flux. For today's video though, I am not doing narrowband, so I'm gonna leave it on average spiral galaxy. And my filter was the Optolong L Quad Enhanced Filter. Unfortunately, that is not an option that's available. For this reason, I'm just gonna pick something that's kinda of close. And I think the beta UHC S should be close enough. One of the things that you're gonna learn as you practice here is that, to be honest, the filters that you choose are not that important. As long as they're somewhat close, it doesn't really matter. So you might wanna spend a few minutes here and figure this out. And you can just try to find something that's close to what you have, maybe using a Canon Full Spectrum. You might want to go with the Canon Full Spectrum, red, green, and blue, who knows. 
the quantum efficiency curve or the QE curve, you can change this if you have a sensor that matches. I do not have a sensor that matches from what I can tell, so I'll just leave it set to the default, that's fine. Moving down, we have the Gaia DR3 SP. If you recall, this is something that we installed back in video number one, and now we're gonna make use of that. So that's where this comes in. Finally, we have the ability to apply a background neutralization to the photo. This can help if you still have some stubborn color casts, but frankly, I don't recommend playing around with it quite yet. This is something we can always do later. So right now, I just want you to focus on your red, green, and blue filters. Select one that closely matches what you have. If you didn't use any filter, then just stick with the default settings, which would be Sony Color Sensor UVR Cut. With everything configured, we can now try to apply this to the photo. There's two ways to do this. You can either click on the square, or I would recommend you dragging and dropping the triangle onto your photo. If you did not stack your images in Pixinsight, then you're gonna encounter an error right now. You'll see some red text and it'll say something about no stars identified. That's because if you stacked in Deep Sky Stacker, ASI Studio, or anything else, there is no star information embedded in your photo. For this reason, you have to do an additional step if you encounter an error. For this, we'll go up to Script, Image Analysis, Image Solver. The Script, Image Analysis, Image Solver tool is designed to replace that step in WBPP. Remember when I showed you how to add your right ascension, declination, date and time, etc.? If you did not use WBPP for your stack, then you have to do that manually right now. This could be a bit tricky though, because if you're working with a TIFF file, especially an older file that you might just have lying around, you're probably not sure what any of this information is. At the very least though, you can search for the target name. Let's say you're doing Andromeda, you would type that in. Select that from the list. Then you just have to kind of guess on the date and time if you cannot find that information. And then for the focal distance, you'd want to think back what telescope you might've been using implement that focal distance and then the camera make sure you know the pixel size of that camera if you've got all the information plugged in though you can hit ok and now pix and will go through and essentially plate solve your image if that's successful then you can run spcc again now when you run it you should not get the red text there won't be any error with any look at all spcc will finish and you'll have two graphs here the first corresponds to the red and green the second to the blue and green. What you're looking for really are the total sources. This is the amount of stars that it found. In my case, 2,534. These are represented by the green dots throughout the line. Ideally, you're gonna have two 45 degree lines with a bunch of green dots alongside them. The more spread out the dots are, theoretically the worse the color correction is gonna be. But I've even seen some where this line doesn't even really exist and this one looks like a shotgun blast and the photo still looks fine. Just understand it doesn't really matter what these look like, but this is kind of your ideal situation right here. The only way to know for sure is to close out of the graph, grab the screen transfer function tool from your process explorer. We'll type in screen. There we go, screen transfer function. And this is critical. In order to see your new color balanced image, you need to make sure that the chain link is turned on. Sometimes we turn this off to play around with things, but if this is turned off and you wanna stretch the photo, you're not gonna see accurate colors. Make sure that the chain link is turned on. Nuke the photo again after running SPCC, and this is now your new image. If things still look kinda of strange though, maybe you have a blue color cast or who knows. Well, if that's the case, you can always go back to SPCC, turn on the region of interest, and now we could specify a part of the photo that should be the black background of space. We've got a lot of choices today, although if we were actually to inspect this closely, we can see there is a lot of faint dust, which we have to avoid. I know from experience that down here, there really shouldn't be any dust to worry about, so maybe this will be my background. Here's how this goes. Up top underneath workspace, we have a new preview mode. It looks kind of like a PDF icon. When you click on the new preview mode tool, you can select a square. Just drag out one somewhere on the photo. Next, turn on region of interest if you haven't done so already. Choose from preview. And then select preview of one. We have now mapped these coordinates as our region of interest for the background neutralization. And so if we run SPCC again on the photo by dragging and dropping the triangle, 
it should identify that there's a bit of a blue-green color cast there and remove it. I have to stress though that that point that you placed has to be on the black background of space whenever possible, even though it might actually be black in this case. There we go. Doesn't that look a lot better than it did before? If it doesn't look better though, then in the top left corner, you have an undo button. That's a good thing to know about, so at any time you can undo it and then redo it to see your before and after. To be perfectly honest, I kind of like the way it looked before, so I'm going to undo it. That's why I said you don't have to do this step, but it's worth knowing about. If things are looking good, you can close out of SPCC, it won't hurt anything. And if you ever want to go back and redo it, just come back to your process explorer, it should be listed under recently used, and all the settings are still the same as they were a few minutes ago. Assuming that your new image looks good though, the next step in the workflow is Blur Exterminator. You might be thinking, well, wait a minute, we already did Blur Exterminator, why are we doing it again? That's because the first time we ran this, we did correct only. That fixed any weird shaped stars in your photo. Now I want to run it again with correct only turned off. This way we can sharpen both the galaxy or nebula, or the dust in some cases, and the stars. If your star is already pretty small, then you don't really have to worry about the star adjustments too much. I might put it to like 0.2. Because what I found is that if you over sharpen your stars, they look kind of blocky and ugly. I'd rather not have that. And then for the non-stellar adjustments, this is going to sharpen up your Orion Nebula, your Andromeda Galaxy, whatever. And for this reason, I really like to have some nice sharp definition. I'll increase the sharpen on stellar to maybe 0.9. And if that's too strong, we can easily undo it. When you've got your settings dialed in, We'll drag and drop the triangle onto the photo. And check this out. Right here you can really see the difference. Let me make this bigger too. So here's our before and after. See how much better this dark dust stands out compared to the original? And I know that some of you will have some blurry data. If so, I think you'll be impressed just how well Blur Exterminator does. That concludes this step in our workflow though. The next major problem I have with the image is the gradient. It's like a dark purple and red over here, and then a light blue over here. If you saw the original version of my Pix and Cypher Dummies Like Me course, you know that I used Graxpert, but I'm really not a fan of that tool anymore. It tends to cause more problems than it solves. Alternatively, there's a tool in here called Dynamic Background Extraction. For many years, this was the go-to for fixing gradients in your photo. What you would do is you'd click on the image to get the crosshair, then you would generate some sample points. Next, you'd move all these sample points to the background parts of your photo where there's no dust or nebulosity or stars. That was very difficult to pull off effectively, and even if you did manage to pull that off, it tended to enhance any problems with the data. So for this reason, I'm not a big fan of dynamic background extraction because for a lot of people, it makes their images look worse. That's why I'm excited to share with you a brand new tool that just came out yesterday, which is gradient correction. Again, you might want to search for this up top. We're looking for gradient correction. The reason I love gradient correction is that it's all configured right out of the box. The only thing you have to do is turn on automatic convergence. Everything else should be set correctly. Then we'll drag and drop the triangle onto the photo. It's now going to go through and analyze the gradients in your photo and remove them. This is now by far the best tool to use for this specific problem. Let's do our before and after. This was before, there's our after. Pretty remarkable, right? However, there will be times this doesn't quite work that well. If you're photographing a target that does not have a bright nebula, you could try turning off structure protection. Because in the parlance of Pixinsight, a structure is like a bright nebular galaxy. So if you don't have a bright nebular galaxy, turn that off and try running it again. Before you run it again though, if you have to, undo it, that way you're back to the default image and try it now. But if you have the Orion Nebula or any other bright target, you probably want to leave structure protection turned on. For more information on this tool, PixInsight actually released some videos on their own which do a good job of explaining what all the different sliders do. I don't want to get bogged down in this today though, because very often the default settings work fine. The only thing you really should have to turn on is automatic convergence. Alright, that was the next step in our workflow, we fixed the gradient. From here, I'm still finding that the background is a bit blue, and I want it to be more neutral. Well, there's a tool for that too, it's called Background Neutralization. We'll type in Background, and there we have it, Background Neutralization. And in my case, there we go. 
we've already specified a background with Preview01. If you still have it, we can reuse it right now. If you don't have this thing though, and very often you will delete it, which I tend to do, you can just create a new one with a new preview mode up top. I should pause for a second though. If you don't have this toolbar, this tends to happen for whatever reason. Go up to View, Default Control Bars, Show Control Bars. If you do both of these, that will fix any problems. Anyway, with the new preview mode tool selected, we'll find a part of the photo that's the black background of space whenever possible. And with that said, I want to take a step back for a minute. We have so many stars in the photo that it's very difficult to tell what is dust, what is nebulosity, what is background. So for this reason, it wouldn't be a bad idea at all. In fact, it's probably a good idea to run Star Exterminator next. Be sure to turn on the checkbox that says Generate Star Image, and then apply that to the photo by dragging and dropping the triangle onto the image. You should now have two separate photos. One is your stars, which we can just minimize. We'll need that later. And here we have our nebula photo. It'll be much easier to find the background now without the stars in the way. So with the new preview mode tool selected, uh, maybe down over here, I'll make this my background. Then I'll go to background neutralization, turn on the region of interest, click on from preview, Choose it from the drop down and hit OK. If you've done all that, we can finally apply this by dragging and dropping the triangle onto the photo. That looks better. There's our before and after. And if you don't like it, you can either move the point around and update the coordinates or just not do it, whatever works for you. I will note that we have a bit of a problem though with the data. See how there's a satellite going right through the image? That's what I was referring to in the stacking video here in the course, where if you still have some satellites visible in the final photo, you might want to find the individual frames that they were in, delete them, and then restack the photo so you don't have this problem. Anyway, things are actually looking pretty good at this point in the workflow. My main concern now is the grain in the photo. I did not have much exposure time at all, so the photo is quite grainy. That's why the next step in our workflow, which I'm sure you're keeping track and you know the number, I do not, unfortunately, but we're looking for Noise Exterminator. With Noise Exterminator, we can pretty much set this to the default settings by clicking on the Reset button. I will say that the default settings are a bit too intense for most photos. You might want to lower the noise to like 0.8, increase the detail to 0.2, and try that. This is where we drag and drop the triangle onto the photo. When that's finished, you can hold down the space bar, and with the space bar held down, you can click and drag over the photo to scroll around. You want to find part of the photo that had some decent detail in it, and then do your before and after here. Let me make this bigger. If you find that noise exterminator has lost some of the fine detail, well, what you would do is undo it, lower the denoise amount even further, and increase the detail slightly. Don't go crazy with the detail though, because you can actually add some artifacts to the image. Again, you should have undone the original noise exterminator and now apply this to the noisy photo once again. If that looks good over here, then we should also inspect up over here where it could probably get a bit crunchy, if you will. So there's our before and after. I'm not seeing any problems with it though, so I'll go with that for our settings today in Noise Exterminator. Okay, we're nearing the end of our basic Pix and Sight workflow. We need to stretch the photo, but we also need to create an HDR image because that core is way too bright. Thankfully, these are both very easy to do. If the photo looks pretty good, we can now officially stretch the image and move on with the workflow. For this, we'll grab the screen transfer function and the histogram transformation. You might need to pause the video, find them, and open them up. With the histogram transformation and screen transfer function tools, we start by clicking on the checkmark icon. The checkmark icon confirms that both tools are targeting the same photo. Then with the chain link turned on, we drag the triangle from the screen transfer function to the bottom of the histogram transformation. If you're on Windows, you'll see an hourglass icon. 
If you're on Mac, you will not see that, but just anywhere in this beige part of the tool. This is now copied the screen stretch preview, which you're seeing, to the histogram. We need to apply it to the actual data, though. And we can apply it to the data by clicking on the square icon. At this point, we have officially stretched the image. To fix the white screen, we reset the histogram, reset the screen transfer function. I know those steps are weird, but with a little bit of practice, this only takes five seconds. Again, we drag the triangle. Click on the square, reset, reset. Drag the triangle, click on the square, reset, reset. Let's do that for the stars as well. So I've got my stars image loaded up. This says Orion stars. This says Orion stars. That's a good sign. And that's why we'll drag the triangle, drop it on the beige part, click on the square, reset, reset. Now for the fun part, we're going to do our HDR. And this is something that you should have installed if you follow along with me step by step in the first video. You'll find it under Script, Toolbox, Create HDR Image, assuming you've installed the correct repository. If this is not showing up, then you'll need to go back and watch the first video, grab the repository link, and get that installed. With the Create HDR tool, it's always a good idea to turn on Protect Colors. The default saturation is fine. And now you have two different things to adjust, the number of layers and the blend amount. The more layers you choose, the less HDR you're going to have. For this reason, I'd recommend five or four for your layers. I'll go with five for today, though. Then you adjust the blend amount to make the core less bright. And you can click on the plus icon up top here to zoom in a few times. Get the Orion Nebula centered up. And increase the blend amount until the core is retained. If you go too far, it's going to start getting unnaturally dark here in the center, which won't look good. So for this reason, just back it off a bit. I think that'll work for us today. I mean, it's not perfect, but the data itself wasn't perfect to begin with. So to apply it to the image, we'll click on the green check mark. Now we have our original version and the HDR image. Pretty radical difference, right? If we compare those side by side. Just look things over carefully. If it looks fake, you can always close this out, run Create HDR Image on this photo again, and confirm it looks better. That completes the standard part of the workflow. Everything I've shown you is pretty consistent from image to image, although there will be slight differences depending on if you're doing Orion, Andromeda, the Ghost Nebula, whatever. From this point forward, I would argue it's entirely artistic what you want to do with the data. You can make it more contrasty, more saturated, alter the color balance, and more. And this is something we cover extensively in my Deep Space course. Because this is the Pix and Sight for Dummies Like Me course, though, we're going to keep this as simple as possible and also kind of cut to the chase. So what I'm going to do is grab my image right here, go to the Process Explorer, and we're looking for curves transformation. So we'll type that in. There we go. And with the curves transformation tool, we can finally talk about some new concepts here. The first is the real time preview. Before we do that, though, make sure the check mark icon is turned on. That shows your histogram. But one of the problems I have with Pix Insight is that the interface is a bit odd. For example, if I want to add some contrast, I can drag a point down drag a point up, but nothing's happening. For this reason, we always have to generate a preview photo, which will correspond to these changes. To add a new preview window, look for the hollow circle icon at the bottom of the tool. This will only be available on some tools, but it says real-time preview. And now this will show us whatever we're doing here on our graph. So if I add more contrast, you can see what we're doing. If things get really screwed up, the fastest way to fix it is to click on the red X and that will reset the curve and you can try this again. Here's something else to keep in mind. Maybe you're not sure where to place your points. Well, if you actually click on the preview here and you move your mouse around, see how it's adding a bunch of points there on our graph. The graph's kind of freaking out. That's where the points correspond in the photo. In other words, if I want to make this little finger of dust brighter, I'll click on it. 
And I know I need to add a point roughly over here. That's where the lines were. Let me show you that again. So I'll add my point here and bring that up. If I want to make this dust darker down here, I'll click. It's actually a bit strange. It's showing us they're above there. So we'll just kind of do that. Now we're adding a lot of nice contrast to the background. And while the background might look good, the core is completely blown out. This is where masking would come in. But to be honest, I still have not mastered the masking here in Pixinsight. This is why I prefer to do most of my stuff in Photoshop. I find it's much more easy to use, especially if you're coming from a photography background like myself. Anyway, you don't have to go quite that crazy. You could just do some very minor contrast if you want to. To see a before and after, come to your preview tool, look for the little blue circle icon and turn this on and off. That does your before and after. If you want to zoom into the preview, click on the concentric square button right here. Then you'll drag out a preview box to zoom in. Now you can see things better. If you want to get back to the full screen, click on this button down here. That gets you back to your full screen preview. And if I do my before and after, you can see we've added some nice contrast, but the image is still a bit flat. Why don't we add some saturation? We can do that by clicking on the S button here for saturation. Add a point somewhere near the middle and bring that up, and that adds more color. Feel free to add as much color as you want to. And in just two minor curves adjustments, we've taken the image a long way. Another thing I could do is go into the individual red, green, and blue color channels. Maybe I want more blue in the bright part of the photo. Well, if the bright part of the photo is up over here in the upper right, I can add a point and drag that up. I don't want to apply to the shadows though, so add a point near the shadows and drag that down. And in this way, I'm adding just blue to the highlights there. This introduces a problem though. We've got so many lines here on the screen, it's getting hard to see what we're doing. And there's a good chance that our red, green, and blue color channels, we're gonna screw it up. I recommend you do things step by step. In other words, do your initial contrast and saturation and apply that to the photo. For this, we can close out of the real-time preview drag the triangle and drop it on our photo to apply it. If that looks good, we're actually going to reset the whole tool now. With the tool completely reset, all the annoying lines have disappeared and now we can really focus in on our red, green, and blue. For this, we'll need to open up another real-time preview and do this again. So what I was saying is I want a little bit more blue in the highlights, but not in the shadows. And I should probably be doing this with the blinds closed because it's a bit hard to see. Uh, but that was our blue color channel. Then we have green. Probably don't want to mess with this one too much. And then finally we have red. So we can make things more or less red. It's all artistic, whatever you want to do to the photo. If that looks good, we'll close out the preview, apply this to the image. It looks pretty good, but like I said, I got some bright lights starting to come through the window now, which is altering my perception of the image. Feel free to mess around with this tool as much as you want. This is a good way to alter the color balance of your photo. There's plenty of other tools that you can mess around with here, but we're not gonna really cover them today, I'm trying to keep it simple. So the last thing we'll do is bring our stars back into our nebula photo. This is our first really complicated part of the video. We're gonna have to do an equation in pixel math, so prepare yourself. For this, we'll go to the process explorer, type in pixel math, and with the pixel math tool loaded up, we're going to enter an equation that I learned from Adam Block. Adam Block is the Pixinsight guru, so if you want to learn even more about this tool, then he's the guy to go to. He'll explain all the science behind everything, how all these tools work, and more. But the equation that he uses to combine the stars is actually pretty simple. It's combine all lowercase. That's the thing with this pixel math. It's very case sensitive, so you have to do this exactly like you see. Let's combine parentheses. Now we're going to enter the two names of our photos, whatever they are. I've got Blend Orion Cloned Orion HDR. That's going to be fun to type in. Then I've got Orion Stars. If I don't want to deal with this crazy file name, I'll just rename it by double clicking on the name tag. You can call this whatever you want. You can do N, Nebula, Starless, whatever is easy for you. I generally go with Nebula though, or Galaxy. And then for the stars, again, you can leave it whatever it is, or you can rename it to stars all lowercase. That would be fine. 
Now we can enter those two names in our equation. So in my case, that's nebula, comma, stars, comma, op, underscore screen. This is the operation of the screen blending mode. So it's going to screen our nebula and our stars together, very similar to what you can do in Photoshop. Then we do open close parentheses, and then a second close parentheses. If you did that correctly, you'll now have the equation that you see here. Just understand that everything we've done is case sensitive, so if even one character is wrong, this is not going to work. Next, we'll go to the Destination tab, and I want you to create a new image. That's all we have to do. We can now click on the square icon to blend our stars and our nebula. All right, and there we go. I will say that the stars and the nebula itself are a bit too bright. And that's something we'll probably save for the Deep Space course because I don't want to get sidetracked with that today. But if you want to play around with this on your own, basically what you're going to do is come back to your stars image and make this a bit darker. Once the stars are darker, run pixel math again. That way they're not as intense. But that is something we cover in my Deep Space course. So the final thing you might want to do is a star reduction. We'll find the star reduction under the Process Explorer. As you can probably guess by now, we're going to type in star reduction. There we go. This is only available though if you followed the first video and you installed the optional repository. If you did not follow that video, this is not going to be here for you. Star Reduction is a fantastic script written by Mike Cranfield with the help of Bill Blanchin, so you want to check those guys out for more information. The way it works though is you start with your target view. This is your stars and nebula combined. And then the starless view, well in my case that was called nebula. So I'll choose that. Then you can adjust the star reduction method. There's like four different choices. I'd recommend going through them one at a time and seeing which one looks the best. You can always drag out a preview to see this up close if you want to do that as well. Just leave it on star method though if you're not sure. Then increase the iterations if you want it even more intense. But watch out because it looks kind of strange if you go too far with it. That's all there is to it. We can now apply this to the photo with the green check mark. When that's complete, we'll close out of the tool and we'll compare our two images. The image on the left is the default. The image on the right has had the star reduction applied. I think I probably overdid the star reduction, to be honest, and the stars are a little bit too small. If you're noticing a similar problem, then just close out of the star reduced image. We don't need it. If it says if you want to close it, that's fine. Then with your original, run star reduction again. I'm going to lower the iterations back down to one, that way it's not too crazy, and then apply this. That's a bit more realistic right there. Again, I know this still needs a lot more work, but we're trying to keep it simple today, so that's good enough. The final step is to save things. If you want to save this entire screen and everything we've done, including all the history of our information here, then what you can do is go to File, Save Project. A project contains all the data on your screen right now. So if you want to come back to this image tomorrow or a year from now, you have that ability with a project. And for this, you would just click on the folder icon up top. This is where you're going to save your project at. Personally, I would put this in the Orion directory. I would call it Orion, Color, Pix Project, something like that. And then you can save it. And now at any time in the future, you'll go to File, Load Project. It's important you do Load Project, not File Open. And now you can find your Orion photo that you've been working on. For me though, I'm not going to worry about a project. I'm just going to save this as a TIFF and a JPEG. For that, we'll go to File, Save As. I normally create two different folders, one for TIFF, one for JPEG. The TIFF is lossless, so that's always a good photo to have. The JPEG, that's just good for sharing online. But uh, for the TIFF, we'll do that first. I'll call this Pix Dummies V1. And then we'll hit Save. The sample format, you could leave this at 32 bits, but if you're ever going to take it into Photoshop, you're better off changing it to 16 bits because Photoshop is really designed for 16 bit images, not 32. Then we'll hit OK. Let's do that one more time and get our JPEG file, save as. Go to the JPEG folder, 
change this to JPEG as the file type. The quality should always be set to 100. Embed the ICC profile and hit OK. And that concludes the very simple workflow for RGB data here in PixInsight. Before we go, I'm going to give you guys all the steps in order that we did today. You can always take notes or correct them if you need to. But this is a good workflow to know. This will get you through most of your data. And then once you're comfortable using PixInsight and going through these steps, you can add more advanced tools along the way. And for that, again, I'd highly recommend checking out my new edition of the Deep Space course, which should be released in April or at the worst case, May of 2024. In the following video, we'll also do an easy workflow for your monochrome data. And even if you don't have a monochrome camera, you still might want to hang in there with us and practice these skills. But that's all I've got for you today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in another video.